every day you heard a different story, a different take on face masks, on vaccines, and people were constantly changing their position because they're listening to other sources of stories. So these stories are very complex. They crisscross each other. Mm -hmm. They don't sit still. And people are constantly negotiating our position in relation to these stories. You are listening to In Pursuit of Development with Dan Bannock. few decades, we witnessed the rise and consolidation of so-called evidence-based medicine among health professionals. Now, this refers to a systematic approach to medicine in which doctors and other healthcare professionals use the best available scientific evidence from clinical research to help make decisions about the care of individual patients. But the COVID-19 pandemic has managed to transform what constitutes reliable medical evidence into a topic of public concern and debate. These debates have taken place within and beyond the medical establishment, such as in news reports and social media posts. And suddenly, everyone began offering an opinion on the efficacy of measures such as quarantines, lockdowns, school closures, and mandatory face masks. How then should we understand evidence? Does evidence mean the same thing in different contexts? My two guests argue that we ought to adopt a more nuanced and socially responsible approach to medical expertise. An approach that incorporates scientific and lay processes of making sense of the world and how we decide to act in it. Using the narrative framework, they offer a model of analysis that sheds more light on why different people arrive at different decisions based on the same sources of evidence and why we must acknowledge their reasons for doing so as rooted in different types of rationality rather than dismissing them as irrational. Ivan Engebretsen is a professor at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Oslo, where he also is the executive chairman of the Center for Sustainable Healthcare Education. Mona Baker is director of the Baker Center for Translation and Intercultural Studies at Shanghai International Studies University. She's also affiliated with the Center for Sustainable Healthcare Education at the University of Oslo. It was great fun to have two live guests in my basement studio in early November of last year. I hope you enjoy this free-flowing discussion. Welcome to the show, Mona and Ivan. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice to have two people in the basement for a change. <laughs> We are obsessed with evidence, at least academics like us. We want to demonstrate that whatever we do is based on sound evidence. It is based on facts. It is based on proper basic research, not just an assumption, not just something that we pick out of thin air. And yet this kind of a gold standard that we often use in terms of generating evidence, it could be through RCTs, it could be through surveys, it could be through qualitative work. Some of this is perhaps ignoring other parts of this evidence narrative as I see it. So mm -hmm. I want to ask you firstly to reflect on what is it that works with the evidence and what doesn't before we actually get to your main argument? The strengths, they are obvious, of course. One of our colleagues, Trish Greenhart from Oxford, she is one of the pioneers in evidence medicine and she but has also become one of the most severe critics uh, of evidence-based medicine. And she says that she still, even if she's critical to what evidence-based medicine has become, she owes her life to evidence-based medicine. Mm. 
she is also a constant survivor and she wouldn't have lived if it wasn't because of evidence-based medicine. Because it started, as you know, as a movement in which... This is the 1990s, right? In the early 1990s, it was introduced. Before that, they had consensus meetings, clinical guidelines, clinical recommendations that, that doctors used in patient treatment were developed through expert statements, yeah. either by calling calling some of the big experts or by bringing them together mm. in one room and deliberate around, uh, around the issues. But now they started to get the procedure how to actually build the recommendations on the most updated research findings. And I think that had a tremendous effect in medicine in the sense that many forms of treatment and other things that they were actually doing in medical practice that actually didn't work. They spent a lot of resources on things that didn't work. Uh, what were they doing? Were they going through thousands of studies, the best practices, and trying to implement that in their patient care? Is that what they were trying to do? And Yeah, they, basically what they actually started to do was to summarize. They find ways of summarizing research literature. Mm -hmm through what is referred to as systematic reviews. So it's a way of summarizing research finding, a systematic way of doing that, and also a way of building recommendations based on those summaries of research finding, rather than talking to someone in a more random way. That's the main revolution, actually. And BM, the BMJ has actually described the evidence-based medicine as one of the major revolutions in, in medicine in the, in the late century. So as a layman, and I want to bring Mona into the conversation, as a layman, I would think that, well, this is actually good because it's based on facts, it's based on yeah. evidence, it's based on what works, something that I've been interested in. So what could potentially go wrong? Well, I'm not a layman, but I'm a laywoman. <laughs> and uh, I didn't know uh, much at all about evidence-based medicine until I met Ivan. But from my perspective as uh, a layperson, all the strengths of evidence-based medicine as I learned it from, from Ivan doesn't really justify the fact that it is based only on facts and that it ignores the very obvious situation that we are all familiar with, which is that people do not act on the basis of facts alone. People's behavior defy facts. It even defies the facts they acknowledge as facts. Even when they agree that these yeah. are facts, they still behave in a way that does not accord with these facts. And that is because human beings are complex beings. And we act on the basis of the stories that we believe, of which facts may be just one part, and often they are conflicting with other facts that we also believe in. We act based on the values we attribute to, um, to any particular course of action we might take. We act on the basis of emotions a lot of the time. Right. We know what is right, but we still do something different because there's emotions involved. There is the care we show towards the people we believe are part of our community. There is our sense of self and the kind of person I should be, I think I should be, others expect me to be. All that is not taken into account at all in evidence-based That medicine. is really interesting. So in this context, it seems to me there are, you know, different ways we could actually classify this kind of advice that is coming from evidence-based medicine. Or to put it differently, on the one hand, you could say that based on evidence, medical practitioners are doing certain treatments, undertaking a treatment, a surgery or whatever, which is different, I would imagine, from the advice that they may be imparting. And so what you were saying just now, Mona, about human behavior, not you know, adhering to this kind of evidence. One example would be just smoking, yes. right? Yeah, exactly. Which uh, I could say that I would like to smoke, continue smoking. By the way, I used to smoke and I stopped a mm. long time ago. Mm. Despite knowing all the dangers, I still decide because yeah. it is how I am. That It gives me a lot of pleasure, right? So can you see that distinction or, or am I making yeah. too much out of this that treatment is different from the advice yeah. which is intended to changing human behavior? But as I understand it from what I've seen, read in the literature since I've started working with Ivan, uh, the take-up of treatment is a big problem in medicine. 
it's no um, good having a lot of excellent treatments that people simply don't take up and you can't force them to take them up. So with smoking, for instance, is a very good example. It isn't just that it's addictive and that it gives you pleasure. It is really, uh, if you remember, you know, back in the 60s and, and 50s, all the films we all the used to watch. The macho men, yeah, oh, the yeah. cowboys. I mean, smoking, it was, uh, it was uh, cool. Yeah. It was a way I tried very hard to smoke when I, when <laughs> I was in my teens because it would have made me look yeah. like an adult, but I couldn't yeah. just, I, I couldn't, uh, you know, physically I couldn't do it. But, but that's how people, get to do things like smoking not because it's the right thing to do but because they are they see themselves as a particular kind of person that this is going to lend them authority coolness whatever you call it so treatment very good treatment without take up and without changing the stories that people are embedded in and that they that affects their behavior is is of very limited use i would say Having said that or identified some of the challenges in treatment, in changing human behavior that evidence-based medicine has faced or faces, you introduce in your work, in your book, the narrative framework. You don't introduce it, but you basically highlight the importance. And I should say here, you're not necessarily advocating doing away with evidence-based medicine, but it is more of supplementing that with the everyday understandings of how people tell stories, as Mona just mentioned, but just how everyday people go about understanding facts, right? It's not about always being rational, being educated, being totally aware of all the alternatives and then making a choice. It is more about perhaps impulsive as you see it today, that that's the kind of attitude I understand the narrative framework is advocating. Yeah, I think so. And I actually, the pandemic is a very good case for us and was a very good case for us because it has been also a crisis of evidence. The pandemic has also become an infodemic, as many people had said, a huge spread of disinformation. And we do not deny that there has been a lot of disinformation related to COVID. And we do not we do not try to argue in our book that every story is as good as another, not mm. at all. On the contrary, we try to say, okay, we have an infodemic here. How can we best solve this problem? How can we address this problem? Well, we cannot address this problem, the infodemic, by just providing more mm. information. But by finding a way for this information to make sense to people. That is through stories. And therefore, we need to engage with their stories. So we say in our book that we need to attend to people's stories. We need to acknowledge the values and principles that underpin these stories. And we need to assess and, when necessary, contest these stories based on the values that the stories encode, not based on some universal ideas of, of, or universal values. Now that we've identified certain challenges to that evidence-based medicine approach, what would be the, the main added value of the narrative framework? Is it that it strengthens the evidence even more? Or is it more about influencing people using language, rhetoric that appeals to people and thereby you can get them to change Mm. behavior without it necessarily upsetting the evidence? There are two ways in which we use narrative in the book. And one, the first assumption is that all knowledge is configured narratively, which means that in order to understand why people are behaving Mm. in particular ways, you have to acknowledge that people are instinctively narrative beings and that a lot of their behavior is informed by, or most of their behavior is informed by the narratives that they believe in and give value to, so that even when you present them with with facts, these facts get embedded within particular stories that evidence-based medicine does not attend to because it only sees the facts in isolation. And so in order to, uh, to understand how to change things, you have to acknowledge 
that not dismiss people as irrational because they don't go by scientific rationality, but you have to acknowledge and understand this kind of rationality, narrative rationality, treat it with respect, attend to it in order to begin to see how you might work with people. That's one claim. The other claim is that narrative, not as a mode of being in this sense, but as a mode of rhetoric, if you like, a genre, a way of packaging information, because you can package information yeah. in the form of an argument, you can package it in the form of a, an editorial and form of a story. But uh, we are also claiming that the narrative format is likely to be the most effective in reaching out to people because you don't need any particular education or expertise in order to engage with the narrative. And narrative also allows for identification. So it opens up opportunities for you to identify with... And thereby deliberate, And therefore, And therefore buy into it, if you like, much more than just buying into a set of statistics or facts Hmm. that for most people, they don't understand anyway. I think those are important points. And I think that the first thing you said, I would like to stress that, that uh, we want to get away from the dichotomy that you have scientific rationality on the one hand, and then you have irrational behavior on the yeah. other. That's the basic dichotomy that we want to challenge through our book. Because, because there is no one fact. Is that is that? No, the, there are different kinds of rationalities. Yeah. Even, even, I mean, scientific rationality is not one rationality, exactly. several different rationalities. The COVID has shown that very clearly. For instance, a conflict, two different scientific rationalities that clashed during COVID was the difference between evidence-based medicine on the one hand and public health logic on the other hand. Evidence-based medicine, which focuses on, you mentioned it, the hierarchy of evidence that RCTs, randomized controlled trials, is the gold standard. And then you have case studies, anecdotes, qualitative research on the bottom of the pyramid. And the best way of creating evidence is through experimental or in experimental settings. While public health paradigm, they acknowledge different forms of evidence, also basic science, also qualitative research. And they say that the best way of testing something is in a pragmatic context, in a real world context. Mm -hmm. And these two different notions of evidence were actually clashing in the debate about face masks. Mm -hmm. While the evidence-based medicine people thought that face masks do not work, the public health people said that, yes, it works, because they had a different conception of evidence. So I think some of this is related to maybe the rational approach having or projecting the idea of very clear-cut boundaries, that there are certain alternatives and that's it. Whereas what you're saying is opening up for a bigger set of initiatives that may or may not work, but should in any case form a part of the advice. Is, Is that a correct understanding? Yeah, well, at least we should we should acknowledge these different rationalities. Take them seriously. Take them seriously. Attend to the different stories, taking them seriously as potentially rational, mm. not as uh, something other yeah. than the, the gold standard. Before we talk about COVID, because there's so much talk about COVID <laughs> yeah. in any case, <laughs> what I wanted to ask you was uh, some of this also applies to previous outbreaks. It could mm. be the yes. Ebola. The, well, even now we're talking about Ebola in certain parts mm. of the world, mm. some countries, but SARS, mm. right? So do you have any um, evidence of what happened or what went wrong in these big crises before COVID hit? Are there any historical examples of how this mm. panned out, this played out during, say, SARS? I think it would only be anecdotal evidence. I mean, if we have any recollection of uh, of how we or other people we know behaved but but i th- i would quite like to to study that in fact we had a project that we we haven't um, received funding for yet of looking at a number of these pandemics and uh, looking historically at what was done 
and how evidence-based medicine worked with them. But at the moment, we, we haven't done the research, so we, okay. you know. Uh, yeah, just to add to that, because I think it's a very interesting question, and I think w an hypothesis that I have without really having studied it systematically <laughs> is that huge outbreaks like this, epidemics or pandemics, like, like Ebola, like uh, COVID, like also HIV, have challenged the notions of evidence and also produced new ways of thinking about evidence. And I know that's the case for HIV, because that is where also this new pragmatic way of, of testing treatments really became important and was also a kind of a result of uh, grassroots initiatives from patient organizations. Mm -hmm. So new ways of producing evidence emerged during that crisis, as we see now during, during COVID, new ways of thinking about evidence that, that emerged and old ways of thinking about them were challenged. Yeah, I sympathize with your approach. I'm not critical of it. What I'm trying to understand or better understand mm. is as scientists, we are used to these analytical categories, the boxes, you mm. place them into mm. neat boxes. It helps clean our thoughts. It structures the way. Yes. It's just like, you know, when I clean my house, it is not so much about the vacuuming that is the problem. It is putting things in place. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That is the structure we have. And so we feel like we know the world. Mm. When I should also say that I remember I had a mentor once who said, we have to differentiate between being analytical and impressionistic. And yes. analytical was always about, you know, being well-structured, etc. Impressionistic is whatever comes to your mind. You don't really have the backing to say something, but you're saying it nonetheless. So the question I have and I'm trying to understand is, let's say we have the structure on the one hand, the rationality approach, and then the evidence, which may of course be extremely diverse, heterogeneous, yeah. coming from all sorts of corners, different types of stories being told by different people. There may be a minority telling a story versus a majority. How do we then grapple with that diversity of the narratives? I think, uh, I mean, what you're talking about is uh, goes back to the Victorian age when uh, that was the age where everything had to be categorized and put in pigeon pigeonholes and given a title and then shelved away and, and then the world was ordered. But we know that the world is not ordered. I mean, the, 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 now it's complexity theory and other types of theory that, that acknowledge, not shy away from the messiness of life that are very much in, in vogue, uh, not in evidence-based medicine, but in other areas of the humanities in particular. And even in medicine now, I know that uh, Ivan is introducing and Trish was here talking about complexity theory. So you, you have these two options. It, it's not either or. I think you can have both and where where it matters. You can't put everything in a pigeonhole. You can't tidy up your house to the point where you can't acknowledge that this is also a place to live. No, I, I didn't actually yeah. mean, yeah, what, what I, but, my question was more mm -hmm. meant, not as I understand it's yeah. not an either or, yeah. but the question is how do we get how do both? You navigate? Mm -hmm. How do we navigate the complexity of the narratives? Yes, yeah. yeah. And actually, that is one of the things that our book is about, is introducing a way of assessing narratives an approach for assessing narratives which is grounded in the narratives themselves and not in some kind of universal standards. And uh, based on uh, Walter Fisher's theory, narrative is narrative paradigm, we are using the concepts fidelity and probability. So probability is about, I mean, the coherence of the, the, the story. Does it hang together? Is it coherent? And uh, the other dimension is about how does this story make sense and why does it make sense to that particular audience so those are questions those are critical questions very very i mean simple questions that everyone can and everyone also automatically use more or less in order to assess stories so we also say that we should assess stories but but it is i mean it is a descriptive framework it it tells you how people instinctively Yes. without even realizing how they make sense of stories and they ha how they come to decide that this story is believable but this story isn't. At the same time, it's not really about telling them this is how 
to assess stories. At the same time, the problem is that stories are constantly changing. They're dynamic. Mm, They don't sit still while people assess them. And we also don't sit still. We're constantly renegotiating our position in relation to the stories that are developing around us. And COVID-19 was an excellent example. Every day you heard a different story, a different take on face masks, on vaccines, and people were constantly changing their position because they're listening to other sources of stories. So these stories are very, I mean, stories are complex. They crisscross each other. Mm -hmm. They don't sit still and people are constantly, it's something we do instinctively. We're constantly negotiating our position in relation to these stories, which is good because it also means that people are not necessarily absolutely set to these stories. So you can change their views. Mm. You can change what they think about vaccines. But Mm. in order to do that, you have to engage with where they are now. Here, of course, I want to add another element. There's somebody then putting these stories together. Yeah. (laughs) And creating some sort of evidence, Uh right? So the the agency of the individual or the institution that is looking at these stories, it could be the news media, Mm. it could be anybody who is in charge of something, something or some institution at that point of time, seeing what is out there and creating a synopsis of the narrative at that point of time, which again then changes the next day or or the next month. Mm -hmm. So then the role of that person or persons digesting that information from the narratives is crucial, I would imagine. Absolutely. And so is access to those narratives. That's also a very important thing. So you can can produce wonderful narratives, but if they don't reach people, they will continue to read the Daily Mail and, uh, you know, the the sources where uh, the narratives that are in circulation end up with the kind of behavior we've seen through uh, during COVID. And we Mm. see as academics, we tend to be dismissive of certain things. We don't want to even read the Daily Mirror or the Daily Mm. Mail, Mm. right? We want to read serious stuff. And so that is also a challenge. If I am trying to filter, if I'm trying to, and I am really interested in the narrative framework, I need to, as one of the agents trying to Mm. filter this information, need to change a bit of my behavior too, because I have to search in different places that I wasn't searching before. Mm. It's it's a new world for me, and I I, I have to be more open. I I can't be as conservative as I am. Yeah, that's true. One aspect that is also comes to my mind now, which is interesting with this whole infodemic that we have experienced during COVID, is that... um, the debate about evidence, which is has until now been, and as we say in our book, been a quite narrow thing that specialists have been discussing, has now become something that mm-hmm. concerns everyone. Yes. Everyone is everybody suddenly became an expert. Yes, yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But at the same time, and that was my point, we have seen a new emergence of, or, or experts. Also, I mean, the medical experts have which actually the evidence-based medicine mo- movement had tried to get rid of. They have re-emerged okay. <laughs> in almost every country. Yes, yeah, but you see, you have seen them here on television in Norway. Yeah. We have new me- medical experts being on television and uh, reassuring people, communicating uh, the recommendations and so on. So it's a kind of a paradox. And I think I we had a, a summer school in uh, Circle U, the University Alliance that we're University of Oslo is part of this summer about evidence and democracy in times of crisis. And there it was very interesting because we had students from many different countries also outside Europe and everyone told the same story about this re-emergence of experts, medical experts on television. Some of these were actually, as in, if I remember correctly, and it seems ages ago that the pandemic started, <laughs> some of these f- were classified or labeled as being fringe people. Yes. Mm. Yeah. So one mm. good case is this whole aerosol spreading, yeah. it, right? <laughs> and that's yeah. something that you discuss in the book too, that there were people on Norwegian TV, there were people, these infectious specialists who were not seen to be mainstream, who Mm. were getting a lot of attention 
because they were scaremongering. Yeah. At least that's what the the mainstream medical faculty felt. Until we have all the pieces together, let's not jump to conclusions. Mm. And there were some of these people who were I'm, again, I'm not using my my phrase on the fringes who were getting this ad- attention because the media wanted something sensational. Yeah. yeah, that is very interesting. But also at the same time, I think that it is important for scientists, even the hardcore scientists who live in labs and, and produce experiments. I think it's very important uh, that they realize, and we argue that in the book, that they themselves are also producing narratives because... That's, that is part of the problem that people who work by evidence-based medicine and see themselves as real kind of uh, serious scientists believe that they only trade in facts, that they don't tell stories, but actually they are also... They're also storytellers. They're yeah, also storytellers, yeah. but they're not aware of the stories that they are part of. And that's also part of the, the story that you tell there, yeah. Dan, is also that the, the, the COVID pandemic showed us so many different stories, scientific stories, yeah. different experts telling different stories. And face masks and uh, it's only, is only one example. Ivan, one of the things that I notice in the book is also, uh, and as you guys have some figures or some pictures of WHO recommendations, yeah. right? Yeah. So we're not just talking about experts, we're talking about the definitive health institution yeah. backtracking yeah. on its initial advice. Since you have both mentioned face masks, I remember how in uh, Asia people were really shaking their heads at how stupid the Europeans <laughs> yeah. and Americans were <laughs> because the Asians, East Asians in particular in China, etc. They were so accustomed to this, it was no big deal. They did not think for all kinds mm. of reasons why wearing a mask was not infringing on their rights. I mean, yeah. I'm sure you yeah. can say a lot about democracy yeah. or the lack of it, but yeah. they couldn't, from a public health perspective, understand this resistance. So yeah. let's let's begin with the initial um, reaction to the pandemic in Norway, in the UK, the lockdowns, the quarantines, at least in Norway, Ivan, if I remember correctly, I actually landed that day from Africa, 12th of March, 2020. I remember that distinctly. And there were no controls at the Oslo airport and all of these uh, rules were announced. And my, my, my son, my oldest son, who is a soccer player, he was very frustrated that he was suddenly in quarantine because of me, because I had traveled abroad, mm-hmm. right? And just the rules kept changing. Again, I would have thought that there would be one set of golden sort of rules that we were going to implement. Mm. But just within a span of a few hours in Norway, the rules changed. So from being very angry and disappointed with me coming home and therefore him, my son missing out on soccer practice, two hours later, he was allowed to go on soccer practice because they changed. So what are the, especially from say the UK, Mona, where you live, how would you explain this evidence that was generated and then the counter narratives that were also generated in the initial years of the pandemic. Well, I think like, as in many places, but the UK was was particularly bad. Part of the problem was the constant change of narrative, which then erodes trust because Mm -hmm. people think if, if this is really the story, it ought to be much more stable than that. So they get the impression that, that these politicians and these scientists don't know what they're talking about anyway. Yeah. Uh, that was part of the problem. The other problem is that unlike the Asian countries you were uh, talking about, Europe in general and the UK and the Anglo-American culture in particular is extremely individualistic. That's right. So having having invested heavily for for decades in making people think that they are unique individuals and that nothing should interfere with what they do in life, that they can do everything in life. And focusing on that, suddenly you were being told, think of others, not just yourself. You can't behave in a way that affects others. Your freedom has to be restricted to the point of even not being able to go out for a walk for mm-hmm. months because of the potential hurt to other people. And that didn't come easy because of these individualistic stories that people have been immersed in for so long. And the idea that nothing should restrict your freedom, that that was your right, your birthright. So both the the, the, the kind of constant change of the narrative 
and then the this sudden rupture in the big big narrative by which they've been living all their lives and thought of as very positive that I'm an individual and I do what I want and I'm independent and so on suddenly that evaporates and you become a number and part of a community that you have to think of others more than you think of yourself and so on that was very difficult What about face masks? Since uh, that is something that you've raised, how is that? I mean, isn't it a persuasive uh, advice to say, look, the evidence says throughout history you should wear the face mask maybe more to protect others from you than than yourself. I, I don't know what was the what was the deal with the face mask. What was the controversy? I think it was about uh, once again it was uh, a reflection of this crisis of evidence that I talked about because. Those who were against face masks, they said that, well, we don't have any evidence because we don't have any RCTs saying clearly that face masks protect you from from transmission or others from transmission. We don't know that because we don't have enough RCTs. But others, like Trish Greenhalgh, who is one of the one of the main proponents in the UK for 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 wearing face masks, she said that. But, but we we have a lot of evidence of other types. We have we have anecdotes. We have we have uh, case studies. We have we have basic science justifying that we should it's it's that we should wear one. And then the the, uh, the the proponents of evidence-based medicine they 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 said that but we need to uh, they talked about the precautionary principle which is a value I mean a valuable way of thinking when it comes to medication and treatment that you shouldn't I mean you you should like you said also you should be absolutely sure before you mm. intervene because before you start a treatment or use that treatment on humans but. Is that a relevant argument when it comes to face masks? Mm. It's, yeah. it's a piece of clothing. Well, you know, I, I was just thinking of all, yeah. all those TV serials that we watched over the years. You know that a surgeon wears a face mm. mask, washes his or her hands yeah. before going into the operation theater. Yeah, yeah. For me, that is evidence enough. Yeah, exactly. that- <laughs> yeah. I agree I, you see, you. I don't think anybody brought that up, actually. No. <laughs> but that would have been a convincing story. That would yeah. have... Because people live by example as well, and but anecdotes like this, they find them more convincing often than. Well, the in fact this case, I would say understand. it's not an anecdote; it's a fact. Yeah, mm. yeah, right. Yes, but it's not something that came out of a, an experiment in the lab. I mean, you can't say we studied. No, but it is an established practice. <laughs> yeah, it's an established, it's an established practice, practice, exactly. But that's another source of evidence, you see, which is not, ev- you know, part of evidence-based medicine. That's exactly our point. That yeah. that isn't taken into account. That kind of evidence that you're talking about now. But I would imagine that that established practice of washing hands and wearing a mask before you go and operate a yeah, patient yeah. is based on evidence. Otherwise, they wouldn't be doing it. At least it's based <laughs> on long experience. It's yeah, a, common sense. Mm. Common sense. Mm. It's, yeah. But I think some of the problem was, as you have both alluded to, it has to do with the loss of freedom. It's one aspect has to do with well i'm fine why should i bother about others yeah. you know says so this personal uh, aspect and the other one is no but things were different before why should you don't constrain my my daily life but going back to the uk mona some of the issues if i recall were also related to the guidelines not being universally universally followed Absolutely. so people were flouting the rules and when it is the prime minister <laughs> oh, when there are national heroes, as yeah. you all write about, both write about in the book, Captain Tom. Captain Tom, yes. Yeah. Then it is uh, different. So, so one thing is to establish the evidence or the narratives and then to devise rules. And then the next step is, of course, to follow those rules and to maintain the legitimacy of those rules yeah. and thereby yeah. create more trust. In this yeah. process, if somebody flouts the rules, then we are really back to square one. Yeah. Yeah, it really highlights the importance of trust. It's such an important issue. We explain this within the the book uh, as part of uh, one of the ways in which people assess narratives, and that is through what we call characterological coherence. So 
So the way you decide whether to believe a narrative or not and whether it has value, part of that is who is telling the narrative yes. and can you trust them? And then when it's when it's the, the prime minister or even more, much more seriously, Neil Ferguson, who was at the very forefront of the rules, really, or, or recommending the rules um, that have to do, he's, a, he's a, a scientist, at the rules that have to do with controlling the spread of the disease, when he starts behaving in you know in the opposite way of what he's recommending then people suddenly say well you know can we trust his recommendation because he himself is not applying it so that's part of um, part of the way in which people assess the value of, i mean in this case i don't think actually if i remember correctly people weren't necessarily contesting the recommendation itself mm. but they were extremely angry at the fact that somebody who sh- who knows why that recommendation is important mm. and who actually put the recommendation out is flouting it for his own convenience right. as it were so all of this then results in the massive generation of alternative narratives absolutely as i understand it that leads to when you're questioning the rules when there is distrust in the system you are then thinking oh there must be something else maybe i should go into an echo chamber mm. where mm. i meet a lot of people <laughs> anti vaxxers yeah. or whoever mm. that believe in this and then we just strengthen each other's bolster each other's mm. arguments is that what happened is that is it the lack of trust the lack of um, following the rules by those who devised the rules that led to maybe a a huge uh, generation of alternative explanations i think so at least it's part of it and part, part of it and part of it is also what you mentioned earlier when you were saying that uh, you coming home from abroad on the 12th of march you had expected a set of rules to be applied yes. so to speak and to stay the rules mm. and then it started to change and everything changed and at at one point no one understood the rules anymore not even the prime minister in norway either mm-hmm. i think uh, everyone there were all the time stories of people breaking the rules because they didn't uh, no longer know the rules because yeah. it was impossible to to navigate well one very good example is our prime minister being told by the health minister in a press conference there has, has to be the 1 meter distance yeah. the physical distancing <laughs> and then after the press conference our prime minister instinctively reached out with her hand right? <laughs> uh, just when we've just said don't shake hands yeah. so, so it's just it's a human error we we don't think yeah. about it because we are used to these social interactions this is how we greet and thank people yeah. and then suddenly we're forced to change it but in terms of say physical distancing in terms terms of face mask in terms of quarantines what happened in the end to that initial evidence that was out there do you think over the years of the pandemic the rules have changed based on the narratives has the, has the change happened because of new forms of evidence so mm-hmm. how did so my question really is how did all of these alternative narratives or that were not anchored mm. in mm. evidence how were they responsible for mm. changing what we or how we understand what to do during a, a future pandemic i actually don't quite know what happened recently because i mean all the rules have been lifted everywhere yeah. <laughs> but at the same time you are told that there are still large numbers of people in hospitals with covid and so mm. you don't quite know what is what's going on and nobody's talking much about it so it's not a clear decision that says okay we know people are still ill with covid but we're going to do away with the rules because that's not being said but obviously it's influenced by a lot of the stories that have been circulating about the harm to school children for instance who are missing lots of uh, time uh, from education the fact that people realized or or argued uh, that it's not sustainable to continue to have no social life whatsoever to to be isolated from people that the mental health consequences are mm. more serious so basically it's a lot of stories that are competing with each other yeah and they have they have to at some point be resolved in one way or another by people who are in a position to resolve them at the level of the nation but in personally instinctively we still resolve them in ways that we thought individually 
made sense to us at the time. So Neil Ferguson, for instance, he, he had no doubt about the evidence. I mean, he's the one who really talked the government into lockdowns and so on. But at some point, he must have decided that his relationship with this lover and his personal life and the value of that relation exceeded the the yeah. kind of uh, exceeded these recommendations. So we each resolved them in different ways, either surreptitiously or publicly in our own lives uh, at some point. And then publicly, obviously, it's the institutions that control what goes on in society that decide at some point, okay, this evidence is still there, the, the virus is still there, but there are all these other stories, all these other considerations that we have to balance. And I think it's another part of this story, and that is uncertainty. Yes. And and actually, I think that it should also be noted that I think the Norwegian health authorities have done relatively well in terms of creating confidence in the mm. population. And one of the reasons for this, I think, is because they have been relatively open about uncertainties. The health authorities appearing at the television in Norway, they have said that, well, this is what we know now, this is what we think, but this is also a kind of a big experiment. Mm. We are thrown into this and we need to make decisions. And I think they could have been even clearer about that because uh, uh, this is also, I mean, a huge crisis also for evidence-based medicine in the sense that evidence-based medicine is a slow process. It happens through first, I mean, developing, it's a translational chain, we call it. First you you exp do experiments in the lab and then you do it on humans and then and so on. And then you uh, have many different experiences before you can make any recommendations and so on. And here, we didn't have that evidence. We didn't have the right number of RCTs about face masks, but still they needed to act. They did, needed to do something. And I think key to, to trust in situations uh, like this is to transparency about uncertainties mm. rather than trying to give the impression that you that this is the right this is the official or this is the gold standard yeah I, I think both of you raised some really important points because the story you're telling me is one of trade-offs that we make every day mm. that as I understand it as a lay person I'm not a medical expert Ideally, when I came back on the 12th, I was actually pretty happy, 12th of March, 2020. I knew that we have ample space in this house. The kids were in mm -hmm. one floor. My wife was in the attic. I was in the basement. We had enough space to, to spread ourselves. I did not feel the need to go out. I felt that, okay, that was my way of controlling mm -hmm. it because the evidence then was to stay indoors or just in your house or just controlled mm -hmm. environment. And so I felt pretty convinced that that is one way of protecting myself. But as you were saying earlier, Mona, that you realize after a while, the kids want a social life. They actually miss playing with their friends and that even you want to see somebody other than your wife, mm -hmm. uh, you know, out, you, you miss your friends, etc. So I think even today, I suppose what has happened is that we know that if we really wanted zero COVID, which is one of the big challenges that China is facing yes. at the moment, on that we, yeah. we have to just curtail all these rights. And I think That's the true. biggest change that has happened, at least as I see it, is that we've learned to live with things, that it is, it is compromising. And, and this is perhaps what Sweden tried to do and was much criticized initially, right? Mm, they, yeah. they almost said they sacrificed their elderly. Yeah, because that is at least that was a criticism. Yeah, I don't know what the, what the evidence says whether Sweden was a success or not. But I think it is as as you were saying, it appears to me a story of trade offs that we make. What is important, and this goes back to the smoking example. Yes, I know that I could get cancer, but it gives me more pleasure, mm. and I so choose to. Continue. Exactly. It's not that you don't know the facts. It's just that some facts don't count as much. <laughs> I think that what you're saying there is key and then actually also the kind of a main message from our book that we're talking a lot about values. Yes. The Great Barrington Declaration in the UK, for instance, was a lot, very much discussed and was used as an example of uh, also like kind of a similar to the Swedish model that uh, 
was about reaching herd um, immunity rather than uh, rather than controlling the pandemic mm, sacrificing the elderly and the vulnerable yeah. Yeah. yes mm. but if you look at the great Barrington declaration and what it actually says it says a lot about other risks with lockdowns mm. such as mental health and and chronic diseases and so on and whether these risks of are bigger than the the benefits of flattening the curve is ultimately a moral question yes not a scientific one like you say so it is fundamentally about values i think what your book really does well is to highlight that this is not restricted the problem that we've been discussing is not really restricted to medicine no, not at all. and mona since you have egyptian roots i mm. have to of course mentioned that COP27 the the climate change conference is going to take place in Egypt in a few days from now and i am very interested in seeing and i will now pay greater attention to some of the stories that have been coming out from african countries from different stakeholders before the climate change negotiations mm. that sometimes or very often differ from the science or the IPCC yes. reports that have a very strict kind of understanding of what needs to be done and i think it'll be pretty interesting in the weeks and the months ahead to see how knowledge on climate change of course this has been going on for many years but yes. i'm particularly interested now what's going to happen how knowledge about chi- climate change the scientific knowledge the modeling often i believe disregards the lived experiences Absolutely. and the narratives of people down there because sometimes we are thinking in Norway about how people in some other country should be changing their behavior yes. based on our understanding of reality and i think this is a big big challenge for the whole climate community is that while storytelling based on what they think is the evidence sometimes i would say very often they neglect the perspectives of people who are facing the brunt of climate change who are aware of it but nonetheless prioritize differently from people yeah. in the global north absolutely i think climate change would make an excellent case for applying this model and uh, if it wasn't for the fact that it's not a medical topic <laughs> strictly speaking although it does cross cross with the medicine i would suggest that we make it our uh, our topic for the ne- we are actually starting to work on a new book and we're st- we're just at the stage of saying you know we're not going to do covid again because <laughs> it's been done uh, so what kind of case study uh, for the new argument do we do we uh, take so maybe yeah climate climate change is definitely lends itself very much to thinking in narrative terms very much so if you were to look into the future and another pandemic that could come do you think we will tell these evidence based stories differently do you think we've learned what what is the mm-hmm. big lesson we've learned from this pandemic that you think will stand us in good stead in the future yeah i i'm not sure actually how much we have learned i hope that we have learned and i hope that we have learned the importance of trust someone said at the, your conference yesterday uh, that there is nothing soft about trust even if some reports have described that as soft soft factors yeah governance and trust is not necessarily they, soft not mm. ne- not soft at all and i think if because i think that not only trust but also i mean uh, also cultural aspects and so on values values that has been the core to the whole uh, how how the pandemic has developed so i think that i really hope that we have learned from that and that we will make preparedness work to be about more than only so called hard factors like more our cities but also about trust values culture and so on it was such a pleasure to have you both in my basement today thank you very much for a lovely conversation Thank, thank you, you thank you Dan. If you enjoyed this conversation, please spread the news among friends and colleagues and share the link to the podcast on social media. You can tag us on Twitter at globaldevpod and danbanick. 
Thank you for listening to In Pursuit of Development with Professor Dan Bannock from the University of Oslo Center for Development and the Environment. Please email your questions, comments, and suggestions to inpursuitofdevelopment at gmail.com. Thank you.